It was a weekday in August 2001. At 8.30 in the morning, there was a ring at the front door. I answered, thinking nothing of it. But when I was given the arrest warrant to read through, I started to feel a bit uneasy. From that day on, teacher Horst Arnold's life changed beyond recognition. He is arrested on the spot. No longer a respectable citizen, he's now a criminal. The charge he faces, the rape of a colleague. His new world, prison. It was five years of hell, 1,800 and something days and nights fighting to survive. On any given day, hundreds of innocent people are in detention in Germany's prisons. That at least is what state compensation payments suggest. The real figure is probably much higher. The system makes no allowance for miscarriage of justice, so it's extremely hard for wrongly convicted persons to prove their innocence. Those who do succeed are abandoned by the state, and it can happen to anyone. A small town in the heart of Germany. Grammar school teacher Horst Arnold arrives at school as every morning. He has personal problems at this time. He's drinking heavily and is regarded by colleagues as difficult. He teaches sport and biology. During a break, he plans to return a DNA model to the biology prep room. Colleague Heidi K is there. The door closes. There are two versions of what happens next. He claims a normal conversation took place. Her version, recorded in the police complaint filed a week later, is that... The wheels of justice turn fast. Two weeks later, Arnold's life is turned upside down. CID officers appear on his doorstep with a warrant for his arrest. I offered the police officers a cup of coffee. I thought it was a bad joke or a case of mistaken identity. I was totally baffled by the arrest warrant. He denied the charge and could offer no explanation for it. After the arrest, Inspector Plefka and his colleagues investigate further. They look for forensic evidence and witnesses, anything that might corroborate one of the two versions of events. We found no corroborating evidence, not even circumstantial evidence. Why? Because there wasn't any. Is that common? It's very unusual. The purported victim, Heidi K, continues to teach at the school. She tells acquaintances about the alleged rape. She also reports it to Anja Kleinert, the school's equal opportunities officer. Straight after Arnold's arrest, she makes Anya her confidant. I was shocked, of course, and I felt I should comfort her, provide some sort of support. I felt responsible for her spiritual well-being at that time. And I think that is why I offered to accompany her to court. The case comes to court just less than 12 months later. All that time, Horst Arnold is detained on remand. He thinks everything will now be resolved. He'll now be set free. Naive as I was and perhaps still am, I believed in the rule of law and hoped that the judges and public prosecutor's office 
would realize that the charge was unfounded. Heidi Kay sticks by her testimony. The public prosecutor's office believes her and calls for the maximum penalty for rape. Horst Arnold denied the charge. It was evidently believed that what he said was a cover-up and that she was telling the truth, that what she said was plausible and credible and that his testimony was therefore not true. But it was her word against his. Yes. And that was enough? That's not a question you can ask a public prosecutor. Then the court's ruling. In the name of the people, Horst Arnold is sentenced to five years in prison for rape. What goes through the mind of a person who knows he's going to spend years behind bars? Despair, despondency, your whole world collapses. What was unusual was that Detective Horst Plefka could only follow the trial from a distance. He was not summoned as a witness, even though he knew more about the case than anyone else. He'd spent months reconstructing, investigating, searching for any scrap of evidence, to no avail. We could find no one who had seen the woman in a distressed state in the school. We had no witness statements. The only statement we had was Heidi Kay's. And that was enough to send a man to prison for five years? Evidently. Weren't you astonished? By the verdict, yes. Only after the verdict was handed down did Arnold realize its full implications. It meant more than just five years in prison. From now on, he would always be a convicted rapist. When judgment was pronounced, I felt my life was over. The despair was that intense. I could see no point in going on. What would I do after serving the sentence? Fears for the future, fear of isolation, and fear is the right word in every respect. I think everyone at that trial felt the right decision had been made. Were it to emerge that the decision was wrong because the crime was not committed, the only criticism that could be leveled was that the wrong person had been believed, not that there had been any dereliction of duty. The mistakes made in the Arnold case do not remain undetected. Another place, another court, another disastrous miscarriage of justice. In the name of the people, judgment is pronounced on Monica de Montcazon. She's sentenced to life imprisonment for murder, a maximum penalty reflecting the gravity of the perceived crime. Could you understand the verdict when it was delivered? No, absolutely not. It had nothing to do with the truth, nothing to do with a fair trial. Nothing at all, not in my eyes. More than a year earlier. It's evening when doctor's receptionist, Monica de Montgazon, arrives home from work. For the last few weeks, she and her partner have been living with her bedridden father, Theodore. He's dying of cancer and they're caring for him. The doctors give him only a few weeks, perhaps till Christmas. That evening I sat and chatted with my father. He was in good spirits. Then, shortly before midnight, I went to bed. About half an hour later I woke up and thought I heard rain pattering on the windowsill. She sees smoke coming from under the door of her father's room. I ran outside just as the firefighters arrived. Her father dies in the flames. 
Shortly afterwards, Monica de Montgazon is arrested. She's not told why until later. At the police station, I was informed I was a murder suspect and had some explaining to do. While on remand, she is repeatedly questioned. She's suspected of having killed her father with malicious intent. They were sure I was guilty. They left me in no doubt about that. She's sent to Pankow Prison, where she continues to insist that she's innocent. Her lawyer has seen defendants protest their innocence before, but in this case, there's something missing. It's a fundamental precept of criminal law that there is no crime without motive, and I couldn't see a motive for my client. I mean, Monica de Mongazon's father had only one to two months to live. If she'd really been after his money, she was set to inherit half of his estate, she would only have needed to wait for a couple of months. She's charged with murder. Blamed not only for the fire, but more importantly, for the death of her father, to whom she is not even able to pay her final respects. I couldn't attend the funeral because I was told I'd have to go in handcuffs with a police escort. I refused to do that. Crime scene investigators secure forensic evidence in the burnt-out house. A chemist concludes that litres of methylated spirits were splashed around and ignited. Clearly a case of arson. But did the fire really start at 20 different points on the floor? The family has to engage its own fire experts at considerable expense and they reach very different conclusions. The CID investigators thought the fire was due to methylated spirits poured onto the floor at 20 different points. We realized that couldn't be the case. Why not? We found none of the usual signs of a fire starting on the floor. No fire on the floor. Litres of highly inflammable, denatured alcohol around, yet it didn't burn. Expert Peter Rabus reckons that's impossible, but he's not allowed to give evidence in court. We'd worked it all out, explained what had happened, but our report went unheard. It was ignored, and the fact that it was ignored certainly contributed to the miscarriage of justice. In its judgment, delivered in January 2005, the Berlin Regional Court accepts the evidence of the CID expert. The judges believe Monica de Montgazon acted in full awareness of the fact that her helpless father would endure the mental torment of seeing the deadly flames approach. They see a case of cold-blooded murder and sentence the accused to life imprisonment. I walked into this courtroom so full of hope, but that hope was dashed, along with all expectations of truth, fairness and justice. Monica de Montgazon is sent back to Pankow Prison, but this time as a convicted murderess. Life shrinks to eight square meters of silence. She spends every minute tormented by the thought that she's innocent, but no one believes her, and that there's nothing she can do about it. Montgazon is not permitted to make phone calls alone. She's allowed hardly any visitors, and when her son pays a visit, she's not even allowed to give him a hug. When you get visitors, you're not allowed to touch them. You can't even shake hands. No contact at all. That's the worst thing you can do to a person, at least in my eyes. While the Montgazon case is now over for the authorities, the family keeps up the fight.
Brother-in-law, Rudolf Jurzic, refuses to accept the court ruling. He continues to look for the cause of the fire. Did you also go into the house? Yes. After it burned down? Yes. What drives him is not knowing why his father-in-law died. He died an innocent death and it's claimed he was murdered. He works day and night looking for an answer to one question in particular. Where did the residues of 20 litres of meths come from? Even on remand, alleged rapist Horst Arnold finds out how prison society works. He also discovers that sex offenders have a very low status. I was constantly threatened, and sometimes the threats were carried out. Beatings. I remember sex offender being shouted from cells across the courtyard. And you sit in your cell and think? Of suicide, for example. Even before going on trial, Arnold is sent to a forensic psychiatry unit. The idea is partly to treat his alcohol addiction, but mostly to administer therapy focused on the rape. Seven psychologists are on his case. In one session, he's asked to write a letter to the victim. There was a flip chart on the wall, a whiteboard with an assignment, write a letter to the victim. But it was inconceivable for me to write a letter to a victim who I knew never existed. So, in my case, therapy focused on confession. Why doesn't he make a confession? That's unthinkable for officials. In their eyes, everyone in prison is guilty. It's not within the competence of the hospital to question a court ruling. We assume that the ruling is correct. So the therapies administered here are based on a presumption of guilt. While Arnold protests his innocence in prison, his parents outside, in the small town of Waldmischelbach, have to contend with the stigma of being the parents of a rapist. We were devastated. We just holed up in the house. Were you ashamed? After what the newspapers had written, I thought there was no point saying anything. No one would believe me. People thought there's no smoke without fire, and then the court imposed the maximum penalty. That was the final straw. She cuts herself off from the world outside. No radio, no newspapers, no personal contact. Helga Arnold now rarely leaves the house. She basically goes out only once a week with her severely ill husband to visit her son in the prison hospital. He tells her of the pressure applied to get him to confess. One day, Horst came into the visiting room quite incensed. Imagine, he said, now they are trying to extort a confession by coercion. They started by threatening me, but then changed their tactics and held out the prospect of privileges. They intimated that as a first offender, I could be released after serving two-thirds of my sentence. My husband was already very ill with cancer. He cried and said, do what they say, Horst, please, then you can come home. I'm so ill. I thought about it for several days, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't confess to something that had never happened. 
The hospital later finds no record of any such conversations. Because Arnold denies committing the crime, he receives no privileges. He's not allowed sport, not allowed out into the courtyard. He rarely leaves his cell, only for therapy. But eventually the hospital gives up. The medical reports describe Arnold as a man of dissolute character and acute moral degeneracy. In fact, he's an innocent person who simply refuses to confess. An army of psychologists descended on Horst Arnold with a whole range of therapies. And they made assessments, yet it didn't occur to any of them that he might not have committed the crime. This is not an uncommon situation. We cannot differentiate between someone who is telling the truth and someone who is trying to avoid a certain situation. We don't have that possibility, not even as psychologists or psychiatrists. Then what good is psychology? Therapy offers the patient an opportunity to change. That is therapy. But how can an innocent person change? At the end of 2006, after five years in various prisons, Horst Arnold is released. Because he didn't confess, he had to serve the full prison sentence. But he soon discovers that the presumption of guilt continues to define his life. Is that freedom? I longed for that day, of course, but at the same time, I wondered about the future. Because who wants to have anything to do with a convicted sex offender? The world outside has also changed. Lawyers' bills have cost Arnold his house. His partner left him while he was in prison. Now broke, he moves to another part of the country where no one knows him. The time in prison has taken a toll on his health. He needs treatment for depression. He applies for hundreds of jobs with no success. The teacher now lives on welfare. There's a good reason that my self-esteem has sunk so low in the last few years. Every attempt to find a job, and there have been more than 200 of them, has pretty much ended in abject failure. Arnold at liberty, in hiding, living on state benefits with a criminal record. The story could have ended there. If it weren't for Anja Kainat, the equal opportunities officer who had believed Heidi Kay's allegations of rape. In the years that follow the incident, Kainat hears some strange stories about the purported victim, stories that fuel doubt, of a deceased daughter who didn't exist, a partner who was shot, an alleged attempt to poison her, incredible stories that are even published. I started to have doubts when I read a newspaper article about the school where she claimed she was poisoned. Another curious incident, I thought. But what really set alarm bells ringing and made me suddenly see things in a new light was when I heard she was claiming that the investigating officer in the poisoning case had been murdered. It was as if I'd been struck by lightning. I suddenly realized that there had been a massive miscarriage of justice. I also felt helpless because I didn't know what to do, who to turn to. I didn't know who would believe me. Anja Kainat turns to her brother, who is a lawyer. 
He doesn't have any experience of such cases, but as a favour to his sister, he does some research and gets in touch with Arnold and his former lawyer. I then looked at the case records, which absolutely convinced me that Horst Arnold was innocent. Hartmut Liro seeks a retrial. The Arnold case is reopened. Monica de Montgazon has now been in prison for a year and a half. What fraction of a life sentence is that? Prison remains an alien world, a life that's controlled by others. She's tormented by thoughts of how she came to be here. The outside world was beyond my reach. I really had been locked away. I thought about the fire, about my father and my son. I was alone with my memories and with all the dark thoughts. But outside, her brother-in-law, Rudolf Jurzic, keeps up the fight. Barely sleeping, he pours over books and articles, becomes an expert on fires to prove her innocence. The crucial question is, where did the meths residues come from? The crime scene investigators found some of the additives used to make methylated spirits in the house, but not all. The main constituent, ethanol, was missing. All four need to be present, otherwise it's not methylated spirits. But no ethanol was present. There was no significant indication of that. Even so, they claimed they found methylated spirits. But if it wasn't methylated spirits, what was it? Fire expert Peter Rabis also did some research and he made a breakthrough. He discovered studies showing that there could be a very different explanation for the residues found. They also result from the combustion of wood, and the Mongazon home contained large quantities of dry wood. There were wood panels everywhere, on the ceiling, on walls, and they all burned away. They were clearly the source. So the residues found come from wood panelling in the house. No methylated spirits, no arson. But the research that establishes that is done not by the public prosecutor's office, but by fire experts engaged and paid for by the Montgazon family. In the light of the new evidence, the Federal Court of Justice allows an appeal. In its ruling, it finds the CID forensic report legally flawed. The murder of Theodore de Montgazon needs to be looked at again. After nearly two and a half years in prison, Monica de Montgazon is released, provisionally, until the new trial. Her greatest wish, to lead a normal life again as quickly as possible. What were the first things you planned to do after two and a half years of isolation? Look for an apartment and a job. Those were my first priorities, to get back into work as quickly as possible and find a place to live. But who gives an apartment or job to someone straight from prison? Help is certainly needed, but the re-socialization system doesn't provide for victims of justice. Innocent people don't need to be re-socialized. But until the old, suspended judgment is replaced by a new one, Montgazon lives in limbo. Two years later, the trial is over. The judgment day arrives. The court dismisses the claim of arson, finds that the fire was caused by a cigarette the father had been smoking in bed. Monica de Montgazon is acquitted. Any comment? I'm happy, but I need time to let it all sink in, so if you'll excuse me. Thank you. 
Monica de Montgazon is now officially innocent. But Horst Arnold, although a free man, is still a convicted rapist. He has time, too much time, keeps thinking back to the day that changed his life. Lawyer Hartmut Leroy tries to reconstruct what really happened behind this door, and he finds inconsistencies. A teacher is raped during a school break in a room that is fairly accessible, and afterwards walks into a classroom to give a lesson. If you look at the layout of the building, you can see there is virtually no way she could have gone from the scene of the rape to the classroom without being seen. If the court had looked at the crime scene, it would have known that was impossible. The scene of the crime. According to Heidi Kay, the following occurred in the space of 15 minutes. Horst Arnold walks to the biology room where a lengthy conversation takes place, ending in an argument. The rape is committed. Heidi Kay flees along the corridor, descends a fire escape and runs to some bushes where she throws up. She then adjusts her clothing, walks to another building and arrives on time for the next lesson. And no one notices anything amiss. Medical examinations reveal nothing untoward. And her clothing? Clothing could not be examined because the victim had disposed of it. She'd thrown the garments in the bin. Hartmut Leroy is struck by another story, something said to have occurred a week later. The rape victim claimed to have been in the market square in Michelstadt one day with her parents when Horst Arnold turned up and shouted to her, I'll get you, you're going to be mine. But the story couldn't be true. Because I was in custody at the time, in Weiterstadt prison. And there are more dubious claims. Although Heidi Kay says she sustained such bad injuries that she could hardly move, Lirol shows that she played several games of tennis on the days after the alleged rape. The court later finds this incompatible with the injuries claimed. New evidence for the defence. And what does the justice system do? What normally happens in the event of new or significant evidence being discovered is that the public prosecutor's office turns to the police and the police investigate further. That's the normal procedure. And did that happen? No. Why not? We put the question directly to the Darmstadt Public Prosecutor's Office. What action was taken when new evidence emerged in this case? Just because issues are raised after a trial, casting doubt, with hindsight, on a verdict, charge or investigation, it doesn't automatically mean that action needs to be taken and that everything previously established is undermined. So, no mistakes and no call for action. Even years after her acquittal, Monica de Montgazon is still plagued by the past. Montgazon. Private fire consultants helped her win her freedom, and the state should actually pick up the tab, but the state refuses, and a court decides that she should pay 30,000 euros herself. They say the experts I engaged took too long preparing for trial and presented excessive bills for travel expenses. But what I don't understand is how anyone can presume to tell an expert that he's too expensive. Is that the price of her freedom? Freedom that she owes not to the justice system, but to the commitment of her brother-in-law and lawyer, and to the expert witnesses she engaged. If she hadn't spent the money, 
She would definitely have been convicted. Without the help of experts, we couldn't possibly have shown how the fire really developed and what had caused it. Monica de Mongazon wonders whether the past will ever let her go, whether she will ever be truly free. Nothing can make up for an experience like that. It destroys your life. Has anyone apologized to you? No, never. Is the German legal system blind to the plight of its victims? They lose their social status through no fault of their own, they receive virtually no help for their reintegration into society, and they are made to wait. It can take years to prove their innocence. Monica de Montgazon discovered that, so did Horst Arnold. His lawyer, Hartmut Lero, had prepared and applied for a retrial by early 2008. Yet it took another three years for the proceedings to start. Three years in which Arnold remained branded a rapist. One reason for the delay? The case papers were left to gather dust at the public prosecutor's office. What did the prosecution service do to help clarify matters? Did the public prosecutor's office in Darmstadt ever do anything to help or endorse the petition for a retrial? No, nothing. Were they supportive at all, later? No. Ten years after the alleged crime was committed, nearly five years after Horst Arnold was released from prison, a decision is finally taken on whether he's guilty or innocent. The appeal court pronounces judgment. The evidence is clear. Horst Arnold is acquitted. The judgment reads, Whatever occurred in the biology prep room of the Georg August Sinn Secondary School in Reichelsheim on the 28th of August 2001, nothing happened that could possibly be described as sexual coercion or rape. To Arnold, the presiding judge says, ten years of your life have been ruined. Uh, I'm naturally pleased with this judgment. I don't see it as making amends. It's more than that. It will change my life dramatically. Not overnight, perhaps, but in the next few months. He is also entitled to damages. How much? Just 25 euros for each day in prison. Germany is the stingiest country in Europe when it comes to compensating victims of its justice system. We meet the state of Hesse's justice minister, Jörg Uwe Hahn. I don't think you can call it appropriate, but what would be appropriate for a day behind bars? It's a symbolic amount. And at 25 euros, it's a very small symbolic amount. But, on the other hand, I don't think it would help anyone if it was raised to 250 euros. Victims of justice in Germany, locked away by the legal system, spit out again and abandoned. No one knows how many innocent convicts the country's prisons contain. Few are lucky enough to have people to help them. But for politicians, the cases that are discovered show how well the system works. We have a system. We have a system, and that system evidently works pretty well. There are a few regrettable instances where mistakes are made, but hopefully they're all subsequently rectified. And there is compensation from the state. I don't know why anyone would want to tamper with that system. Horst Arnold is supposed to receive 25 euros in damages for each day of the sentence he served. Compensation for a disrupted life and five years in jail. 
What hugely depresses him is the endless wait for a chance to work again as a teacher. Now confirmed innocent, he eagerly awaits a letter from the education ministry that dismissed him without notice in the wake of the alleged crime. But no letter comes. Yet again, the state lets him down. What kind of life do you lead now? An impoverished life, very poor. A life with no structure. Sometimes I just live for the day. I don't know what the future holds. What happened to me 11 and a half years ago was dreadful. But perhaps there's something positive waiting to happen. I'll go wherever I'm offered a chance of a career. And a chance to make a life. That as well, yes. On the 29th of June 2012, Horst Arnold dies. It's nine in the morning when passers-by find him lifeless on the pavement. Horst Arnold died of a heart attack. He was 53 years old. Right up until he died, Arnold was dependent on social security. He never received a cent of the compensation he was due, nor was he offered a job or an apology. This is utterly... It's sad, of course, and a bitter disappointment to me that I was not able to help him get the satisfaction of an acquittal sooner, and also, perhaps, financial compensation. I was deeply shocked by the news, and I still am. I'm extremely sad because, after all he'd gone through, I really hoped he could lead a normal life again, have a career, a wife, a relationship, all the things he was denied for so long. I can't imagine how much he must have suffered. After the arrest, Inspector Plefka and his colleagues investigate further. They look for forensic evidence and witnesses, anything that might corroborate one of the two versions of events. We found no corroborating evidence, not even circumstantial evidence. Why? Because there wasn't any. Is that common? It's very unusual. The purported victim, Heidi K, continues to teach at the school. She tells acquaintances about the alleged rape. She also reports it to Anja Kainat, the school's equal opportunities officer. Straight after Arnold's arrest, she makes Anja her confidant. I was shocked, of course, and I felt I should comfort her, provide some sort of support. I felt responsible for her spiritual well-being at that time. There are two versions of what happens next. He claims a normal conversation took place. Her version, recorded in the police complaint filed a week later, is that... The wheels of justice turn fast. Two weeks later, Arnold's life is turned upside down. CID officers appear on his doorstep with a warrant for his arrest. I offered the police officers a cup of coffee. I thought it was a bad joke or a case of mistaken identity. I was totally baffled by the arrest warrant. He denied the charge and could offer no explanation for it. And I think that is why I offered to accompany her to court. 
The case comes to court just less than 12 months later. All that time, Horst Arnold is detained on remand. He thinks everything will now be resolved. He'll now be set free. Naive as I was and perhaps still am, I believed in the rule of law and hoped that the judges and public prosecutor's office would realize that the charge was unfounded. Heidi Kay sticks by her testimony. The public prosecutor's office believes her and calls for the maximum penalty for rape. Horst Arnold denied the charge. It was evidently believed that what he said was a cover-up. It was a weekday in August 2001. At 8.30 in the morning, there was a ring at the front door. I answered, thinking nothing of it. But when I was given the arrest warrant to read through, I started to feel a bit uneasy. From that day on, teacher Horst Arnold's life changed beyond recognition. He is arrested on the spot. No longer a respectable citizen, he's now a criminal. The charge he faces, the rape of a colleague. His new world, prison. It was five years of hell, 1,800 and something days and nights fighting to survive. On any given day, hundreds of innocent people are in detention in Germany's prisons. That at least is what state compensation payments suggest. The real figure is probably much higher. The system makes no allowance for miscarriage of justice, so it's extremely hard for wrongly convicted persons to prove their innocence. Those who do succeed are abandoned by the state, and it can happen to anyone. A small town in the heart of Germany. Grammar school teacher Horst Arnold arrives at school as every morning. He has personal problems at this time. He's drinking heavily and is regarded by colleagues as difficult. He teaches sport and biology. During a break, he plans to return a DNA model to the biology prep room. Colleague Heidi Kay is there. The door closes. 